Welcome to Outsider Gaming. You're here today with your host, Paul. Uh, I have a very special guest joining me today. He is uh, absolutely a jack of all trades. He puts me to shame with all his the different skills and different things he's done in his career so far. He is a writer. He has a background in uh, special effects. Uh, he has a background in computer games. He has won awards for his short film, Sync. He has also made other films like uh, The Beyond and very famously Katie Saka film, 2033, Origin Unknown. And he reminded me earlier, he also has stuff going on with Disney. So I better throw that in. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone to Has the Lull. Welcome. Thanks, Paul. It's been great. Um, great intro and yeah, happy to be here, man. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it feels almost like deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> um, so look, to start us off, uh, your background, your career with kind of computer games and the VFX and all that stuff. At what point were you inspired or did you not have enough on your plate that you decided you were going to open your own uh, animation studio with Hazimation? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it will stem back to like, you know, like, I mean, I worked in video games back in 98, working on like PlayStation 2 games. Like I was working on a game called Motocross Mania. And mm -hmm. I was like an intern first and then became an artist. And I worked in cinematics because I didn't go to film school, but I loved movies. Ever since my dad bought home the VHS copy of Blade Runner, I'm like, oh, what is this? What is this? This is not sci-fi. <laughs> I had the sci-fi Star Trek and Star Wars. What is this? What is a replicant? And I'm like reading, nerding out on like Philip K. Dick books, like, you know, the Android Dream of Electric Sheep and so on. And then William Gibson, I became a freaking sci-fi nerd. Um, so I always wanted to make movies, but um, my entry into movies is, is through video games because I was doing mm -hmm. cinematics, specifically the stuff that said uh, full motion video on the not game footage. Yeah. So I did that for a while. And then eventually I'm like, I want to go work in movies, man. I want to work in games. Like, I want to do it properly. So I applied to work in visual effects and it was, there was a level of snobbery back in the day. Like, you know, if you, if you were um, an artist who had a games portfolio, and like, oh, here's my here's my PS2 cinematic cutscene that I did. They're like, yeah, we're making movies, man. You know, we're just doing the Hulk and Harry Potter. Like, <laughs> whereas now is a whole different thing. Now, like, it's freaking rock star if you work in games. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, yeah, absolutely. Then, it was like, mm, no. So I started from the ground up in film. I was a compositor, so that meant taking CG CG passes like a dragon or something, and a and the photography plate, which is the live action, put them together. My big break came from working on this movie called The Dark Knight where I worked on the previous. Wow. Yeah, so that's where a lot of my film school came from because the previous team back then were very small. We were on Pinewood. There was like, um, there was a company called Envis who who hired me. And you know, our job was to like take the script and build it on the computer and show it to the director and the supervisor and say, you know, this is what we're thinking. Um, yeah. So I learned a lot about editing, a lot about pacing, camera, blocking, all that came from working on previous. And then I then you can imagine after that gig, I never had to show my CV again. It's like, oh yeah, you're hired. You worked on that show. The, um, the Batman guy, yeah. yeah. yeah the Batman guy, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then from there I became um senior composite and then became a VFX supervisor where I got to work on set a lot and to figure out how to solve problems on set. Like usually the problem is like, you know, we've got this big ambition, we've got this budget and this time. How do we make that work? And and that became my that became my my thing right today. <laughs> I still had that same issue that we face. Um, but then while I was working in VFX, as if working in VFX wasn't like long hours as it is, I was making short films in my spare time because I was so inspired of all the directors I was working with and stuff. I'm like, I want to make my stuff. And um, I did a short film called Sync, which was really cool. I had so much fun doing that. Yeah. Um, but then the one that broke out was um, a fake documentary called Project Kronos where it was about putting human consciousness into a ball and then NASA sending it out into space. And we make, we make contact with extraterrestrials on a very wow. um, yeah. conscious level, but it was all done using NASA footage. So I would download all the footage from the NASA website, which is public domain and using my visual effects background, I would composite and replace stuff. And then I'll get some actors and film them, you know, to yeah. say a bunch of scientific stuff and kind of cut it like a, like a documentary, like a discovery channel thing. I went on YouTube and everyone on YouTube thought it was real. Like, oh my God, how did NASA do that? It's unethical. <laughs> like, it's not real. Um, but Vimeo was when I got the Vimeo star pick. And that's when things start to blow out of proportion. Like, you know, all these like well-known um, websites like io9 and all those places are covering it. And then Variety covered it. And then there was a bidding war. I didn't know what a bidding war meant. Uh, and usually it means studios are fighting for that piece of property. I got yeah. signed to a manager. I got signed to an agent. And, and I was 
the whole Hollywood thing, right? Which is amazing. Yeah. And I learned so much. I ended up getting writing gigs to work for Paramount and Fox. It was amazing. But then two years go by, I'm like, so I haven't made a movie. Going around in circles on this script that's going to take forever to be made. And um, and I had the problem of that. I was a first-time director. Doesn't matter how many short films you've made. Doesn't matter how many awards you've won. It's, you haven't yeah, made a you're the first. You're the first-time director. Yeah. So I'm like, mm -hmm. What am I going to do? I'm like, so I had some money saved up for a house. You know where this is going, right? I'm like, buy a house, make a movie, buy a house, make a movie. Oh, fuck it. Let's just make, make a movie. And and I'm glad I did. I would never change anything because it forced me to not waste a single penny. Now, when yeah. it's your own money, if you shoot that, that's going in the movie. That shit's not getting cut. <laughs> hey, you storyboard the fuck out of your shots big yeah. time. <laughs> like you plan, you watch every penny. Like no one's having expensive caviar on set, okay? Um, all of that stuff. Uh, and we did that. And then flash forward, um, it came out in 2018. It came out and it was number two in the iTunes charts next to um, Blade Runner 2049 and Wonder Woman, which is kind of amazing. Because Blade Runner is my favorite films. Yeah. Um, and it became a very profitable movie. Um, like within April, we had made our sales report back. We had we got a sales report back and we had made all my money covered. I had a bunch of people that helped me out on deferred fees and or working on very minimal fees just to help me get the movie made. I got went back to the hey guys, yeah, here's money you should have got paid. There you go. And they're like, what? <laughs> no, no one does this. But we had two visual effects companies that helped me out because obviously my relationship in visual effects, you make a lot of friends. And they're like, look, we'll help you out. We just wanna, we just wanna see the underdog vfx artists going to the world of directing yeah yeah but i'm like no like who, who do i who do i send this check out to so it felt good because like when i worked in vfx as an artist i had worked on like yeah everyone does that you work for free to get your portfolio going yeah, it, yeah it's it's a thing right and um, and you never expect anything back from that and i just thought you know wouldn't it be great if one day i i was that guy that you know the film was commercially a success and like i can't go around telling the world oh the film's commercially successful and these guys didn't get paid their full rate so hmm. it felt good doing that obviously i had a lot of brownie points doing that through the team and it's great but it's an ethos and that and then when i end up making my second movie um with um katie Sacco, origin unknown the producer on there were, and one of the producing partners on that was paula crickard and she had worked on harry potter worked on a ton of movies she's now my business partner uh, but yeah. how that happened was that we we she watched the beyond because remember when i made my second movie the first film hadn't come out yet so technically still a first time director. You're it's still a first director, out. yeah. Like, oh my God. <laughs> and it's a lot of pressure because I financed like 95% of the films financed by me and then the rest of us, two equity financiers came on and then, you know, government grants and so on. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of pressure. Like, you know, I could lose a shit ton of money. Like, you know, wish I should have bought a house, fuck. <laughs> and you always have this doubt, like, oh, maybe I should have bought a house, fuck. But um, luckily my, you know, my my partner and like, you know, um, she was so supportive. She goes, I oh, just make the movie because you're, you're always going to say, what if, right? Just You know, I always live in a tent. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but her thing was like, she was like, look, do it. There's so many houses you can buy in the future. Like, just make your film. Yeah. Don't fuck it up. And that's like the, the heart. <laughs> that's like the most biggest pressure. Like, no other pressure could come more harsher than your your other heart. From your your <laughs> misses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, fuck. So, and I remember Paula watching it. I, I don't even know Paula. She, you know, she at the time she was like, come on to like as a post producer. She goes, oh, I really liked your movie. Um, I have some notes. I'm like, oh, okay, go on in. What's your notes? And she she came up with some like notes that I didn't really think of, which was like, there's a lot of visual effects in this movie it, for a documentary. I kind of thought. It doesn't feel like it. Like your short film really hit the nails. I didn't know if it was real or not. And I feel like you might have gone a bit too far of that because of the whole Hollywood thing. Yeah. So we ended up doing a couple of reshoots and she was really instrumental in that. And the film became a success because like partly she she you know, voiced that opinion. And I kind of toned to it down to make it more real. Yeah. We based, up, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I always share this story. So we had a ton of visual effects shots that look gorgeous, right? And we screen tested. That's something that I never knew I could do was screen test. And obviously Paula working for like Lionsgate and so on. Yeah. He goes, you should screen test. I'm like, oh God, I don't want people to rip my film apart. But we screen <laughs> test it and you're not in the room. It's fine. You get the cards and the scores later. And the main note came out was like, well, it doesn't feel like a documentary. Like when you watch a Blumhouse found footage, it's like the following you're watching is found footage, like Blair Witch. Yeah. You don't get that on there. It felt very, and that's because I was surrounded by the world of Hollywood. I had a manager who was like, make it big, make it big. And in reality, you should just like, you know, we're going to talk about Fortnite later and embrace, embrace the medium to get the best possible yeah. story. You know, Blair, which is still one, a terrifying film in my opinion. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't go fucking camping because that film <laughs> <laughs> terrified the shit out of me. Um, but, you know, when you make a, a, something small and it's all about story. So um, the note was like, you know, so much visual effects, but here's the thing. The distributor 
already bought the movie. They like the movie. They go, we love the movie. Like we're going to release this in three months time. A company called Gravitas Ventures, a lovely um, distribution company. And I'm like, you know what? I want to hold back the release of the film. They're like, wait, what? <laughs> I want to hold back the release <laughs> of the film. And um, I want to do some reshoots. And um, and I uh, I want to strip out the visual effects. They're like, what? No, that's the marketing. <laughs> no. And I explain to them. And there's like two guys that worked at the time, a guy called Josh Spector and um, uh, Scott Kaplan, who are no longer there. They've got their own thing going. But they, I, I guess I was very lucky. Because there's always horror stories of distribution companies, like especially indie filmmakers getting shafted, right? Big time. Yeah. I was just so lucky that these two guys genuinely liked the film. They were quoting scenes from the film, like, <laughs> my God. Yeah. And they're like, good. you know what has? Make the film you want to make. You know, we're here. We're still going to distribute the film. Like, <gasps> And like, yeah, I can, because you know, I hear horror stories. Like, oh, man, they're going to shaft you, man. They're gonna, you're never yeah. going to make any money in your first film. And I was prepared for that. Like, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll take the hits, kind of. But um, we did it. And we still had to address how do we how do we make the visual effects look shit, <laughs> right? Because they look so <laughs> glossy. We had we're to too good at our jobs. We need to do we need to do worse. Yeah, it, it looked <laughs> shiny. It was like oh, how do we make it gritty? And even if we went in and did like additional gritty parts, it would take you know like 120 visual effect shots. It's a lot of time. So I just had this like, and this is what I mean about when you're put in a box and you got no money, no yeah. time. Sometimes your best ideas come out. I'm like. What if, and I had an Apple Mac Retina screen, I'm like, what if I get my cinematographer to come around with a black magic 4K camera, get some black sheet in, blacked out the room, and played all the visual effects shots into camera, right? So now you get all right. of this free stuff, like chromatic aberration, I was doing rap focusing, I was keeping a bit of handheld. Now, when I cut that footage of my visual effects shots playing into camera, next to the talking head footage, it looked like it's the same cinematographer that shot the, set, shot the visual effects yeah. scene. And it, Oh, and then, and then we released the film, and we're getting reviews. And one of the reviews was from Cinefx, which is an amazing visual effects company, and um, visual effects and magazine. And they said, "Well, we would expect the visual effects to be that good because they look like they're shot in camera. They're that good." And I'm like, "They were shot in camera." They're like, "No, it's just the same. They look good." I'm like, "No, no, no. We shot it in camera." And they're like, "Really?" <laughs> so I always say this story because it's the most bizarre lo-fi approach to getting visual effects done in yeah. camera, and it worked. It worked. It's a documentary, right? Yeah, very good, very good. So how how do you go from there and the world of Hollywood and films to let's go make games? Well, okay, so after we made the second movie, Paula Crickard and myself were like, now Paula's worked 30 year veteran, tons of movies. Last film she yep. did was Expendables 4. And she was like, have we got to the point now in our careers where we should make our own content as opposed to like, you know, being a hired director, being a hired yeah. producer, because that's essentially what we both were. Well, like, well, why don't we just set up a production company? And the thing about Paula, she's like, I'm like, let's go make a movie. She'll be like, hold up, I'm gonna read the small print. She's like, <laughs> right? So I'm like, and you, I, I wanted someone that was the opposite of me, but still yeah. shared the same vision of we just want to tell good stories, right? And figure out really interesting ways to make films as opposed to following the traditional legacy of making films, like yeah. traditional ways. Um, so we decided to set up a production company. It was called Has Film originally. Uh, and it was a vehicle for me for all of the projects I had that, you know, we go and make them live action. And we had a few that was going into production. Um, and then the pandemic hit. I'm like, yeah. oh, live action <laughs> being put on hold. What are we going to do? But I was using a game engine already, a very early version, like Unreal Engine 4.16 or no, 4.12. 4.12. We're like Unreal yeah. Engine 5, but it's 4.12. And I was doing pre you know, like yeah, um, CG animatics of what the film could be like. And I was showing these animatics or these previs to studios or financiers or even talent. And yeah. they're like, what are we watching? I'm like, previs. Like, no, no, no. We've seen previs. Previs is gray, blocky, you know, <laughs> kind of steppy. We get that. That looks fully rendered motion capture. It looks like a game cinematic or or a first pass animated film. And I'm like, hmm, what made an animated film? So I'm looking around. No one's made an animated film in a game engine. And I talked to a few of my animator friends are like, yeah, yeah. it's a game engine, though, isn't it? I mean, the proper animation is like Pixar, DreamWorks, or you have teams of hundreds of people. <laughs> you have Maya Houdini pipeline. You have an expensive render farm. You're not going to yeah. render an animated film in a game engine. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, we're in pandemic. What do I got to lose? So we, I, I pitched it to Paula, and we had done a bunch of short films we did one called battle suit we did a sizzle trailer called mutiny Year zero which is now the the film that we're working on mm -hmm. and so we and we had a lot of exposure already on that um so paul was like well if we're going to make an animated film we should make an animated film 
that reflects the medium of animation. You know, Spider Verse is one of the best examples. I always say like, that 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 could not be made without animation because it respects the no. medium so well. Yeah. Um, and so it's we, got different frame rates and everything going on. It's crazy. Really. Yeah. It's like, it yeah. breaks the rules, but does it so well? Yeah. I love it. Um, and that was a big that was a big inspiration for us as well. Um, but then, you know, as with every production company, you have a bunch of like scripts in development and so on. And one of the scripts was this script that, um, well, this outline I wrote called Brother, which is about this big brother breaking out his little brother out of a medical facility because his little brother has special abilities. I think Akira. And um, and they're doing experiments on him. And uh, But he has the ability to distort time and space. And every time his brother fails, he resets the switch like Groundhog Day. But every time he resets the switch, he's getting weaker and weaker. So uh, the billions okay. of possibilities, is he going to find the right one? And does the action and consequences affect the reality of finding the right outcome? It was very, very deep and stuff. But it had... sounds like it could be a good game as well. <laughs> well, that's, and error. I'm going to tell you that one in a minute. I'm going to tell you. All right. We end up, we end hey, up Dark like Soulsy. A... Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's nice. You know the reference. <laughs> Damn it, busted. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I've got the Kira poster right behind me now. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm inspired by lots of stuff. But but yeah, so we, we had the script called Brother, and there was a lot of action sequences, like physics defiant action sequences, gravity bending sequences that you like, it's unshootable unless you're James Cameron or something. So we're like, let's make that. So we bought a writer called Stavros Pombalis, who had worked for work in title and so on. And he came on, we did a script pass, and we just went ahead and made the film. And we an epic came on and said, Hey, you know, we love what you're doing. You know, the fact that you're 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 doing proper transmedia here, like you really are yeah. making a feature film. Um, we'll give you some funding. So they give us a little bit of money by the mega grant scheme, which has been phenomenal because they not only just give you great money, but they also give you a lot of support and everything yeah. to help us guide us the right way and stuff, which is great. And having the epic seal of approval, is, it kind of makes you look badass in a way. Yeah, um, so which is cool. As we finish that movie, that movie comes out early next year. But while we were making the movie, there was like a, I don't know if you see in the trailer, it's a big car chase scene. And to animate car physics, like having worked at companies like Codemasters back in the day mm -hmm. working on Colin Ray Rally. I know how hard it is to animate cars and the physics. But I also remember playing the game, there's a lot of physics. So I'm like, what if we stuck a controller in and I just drive the car and we record the animation of the free in-game physics. Play the scene. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. just bake the animation into sequencer, which is the timeline in Unreal. We did it and I'm like, that was cool. But you know what? That was so fun. What if we made a game and we just end up doing a game jam session <laughs> on weekend, which grew out to like two people, three people, five people. And now we got signed with Microsoft Idea Xbox, which is the independent developers program for Xbox. Mm -hmm. And we have Xbox dev kits in our homes, I know. And we're making a nice. game and it's called Max Beyond. We didn't want to call it Rift because the movie yeah. called Rift is great. Calling your game Rift is a problem because there's hundreds of Rifts. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we had to like, mm, let's rethink that one. So we did that. And and then from there, we just got the bug to making games. And you know what the funny thing is? When I left the game industry back in like 2003, I'm like, see ya, I'm going to work in Full movies. circle. Full circle. Full <laughs> yeah. circle, but also it's blurred massively. Dude, yeah. I mean, I... I read somewhere Blumhouse, you know, the guys who make the horror films like Insidious and Conjuring and, and The Purge. They've got a gaming division. Bad Robot. Wow. Yeah, Bad Robot. J.J. Abrams' company has got a gaming division. Skydance has got a gaming division. And hey, hey, Even Netflix are, are setting up a game. Netflix. Netflix has got yeah. a dedicated building just making yeah. games, right? So it just shows you how much the lines have blurred massively. And now, you know, like, you know, one of the biggest animated hits of this year was Mario Brothers, right? Do you remember but, back yeah. in the day, the original Mario or the, the Street Fighter movie that came out? Which was <laughs> so bad. I still, I still liked the Mortal Kombat one though. The original. I was gonna say the Mortal good. Kombat was good. very cool. That, that, <laughs> that kind of, but that was done in a way that was like it because I think Mortal Kombat had that live action feel in the game because there was scans yeah, active. it was scans yeah, it motion cap. Like, that, yeah, so you're like that works and it, it had a great soundtrack, but Street yeah. Fighter felt very cartoony with Jean Claude Van Damme and so on. Great actors, just, just. And they didn't know how to make those kind of films back then because yeah. the the games market and the film industry just wasn't gelling. You know, the film mm. the film executives go up and redesign everything, and whereas now yeah. we're like, well, hang on, let's play in the world of the game because the game they spent a decade creating that world. Why would we re-engineer it? Let's just bring a Hollywood and games and create yeah. something of an experience. So I think that's why Last of Us the series worked so well. I mean, they even got the they even got the game director Neil Druckmann to direct an episode. To, of Last he did of an Us. episode, yeah, yeah. And a lot so of the, a lot cool. of the characters are are playing bit characters in the show totally, as well. Totally, totally. But it's it's kind of like games went 
Hollywoods first. Yes. Like they went, let's go narrative story driven games. Let's make very immersive, very real. And mm. now Hollywood are coming back to the games and oh, this is an untapped resource. Let's let's start making films out of games. And it's like, yeah, they <laughs> stole it from you first. But yeah, exactly. it's, it's good to see. Exactly. No, but it, it is it is a really interesting time we're living in. And I think, you know, a lot of this is because accessibility is a technology. Like, mm. I, we wouldn't be able to set up an animation company uh, if we didn't have the ease and access of tools like Unreal Engine. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, yes, yeah, even Photoshop and Premiere play a big part of that. You know, to be able to, like, edit your own stuff on your laptop and make a movie. You know, back then you need expensive yeah. cameras, expensive edit suites and stuff. And it's the same with game development now. Now you just download Unreal, download Unity, and make something. I mean, there's people making really great games in Roblox or Sandbox. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, people are making these games, and these and these developers are like 16, 15 year old developers that are doing some <laughs> amazing stuff. I'm like, so I think it's we're in a very very interesting time. I think. Yeah, yeah. And it, you you mentioned Unreal Engine, and I know it's 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 something you're in love with. I mean, I can see all your work through the years, and you're using different iterations of Unreal Engine as you go and. Obviously, now we've got Unreal Engine Five. Yeah. We've seen some of the capabilities, and it's it, it's the future. We've got the Matrix showcase was phenomenal with all the all the different things that showed off the nodes and things like that. It mm-hmm. showed the lighting effects, um, and we've even seen people run with that, grab the ball and run. We've seen where they're bringing AI kind of into NPCs, where they're having more natural conversations. You can ask a question; they'll give you the answer. Like this. It, it's exciting and it's evolving and it's very fast. Are you guys feeling that excitement? Are you also going to go and run with the ball and see what else you can do, especially as Unreal keeps developing? Definitely. And the the AI thing that you mentioned is actually um, a company called InWorld that's creating Mm. these, these um, it's one of the, it's it's one of the highest funded um, startups and it's it's set up. One of the founders is a guy called John Gator. He is the visual effects um, person who created the bullet time thing in the matrix oh wow yeah, yeah. that's john so that john gator is one of the founders of that company in world and I'm, i met those guys um not john gator but they met the team um in world at gdc and it's phenomenal the stuff you do i mean mm. you you're going to get to a point where every time you meet this character it's like a new experience like you play the game yeah. you'll get one set of answers i play the game and it's all dependent on what i'm doing and re- it's reacting to my actions it's phenomenal yeah. like i mean look I remember playing Zelda on the Game Boy, right, when I was a kid, right? <laughs> and I yeah. really believed that I was buying freaking magic potions from someone in in, in, the, yeah. in, in the store. I'm like, oh, my God, this person saw me a magic potion. And that's a kid. And now we got to a point where AI has emotions and, and, can, and can, like, yeah. have a conversation with you that feels a little bit natural. Like, what? That's exciting. But, yeah, I mean, you mentioned AI. <laughs> it's kind of a dirty word and not a dirty <laughs> word. Like It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not stealing people's jobs and just making things slightly better, I, I think it's okay. I think, I think it's so. Okay. Or, or it's not stealing people's work, I mean, which is the big thing yes. that Mid Journey has had a lot of stick about. Now, I I, I love Mid Journey. I, I, I was one of the first to use it. And mm-hmm. I think it's amazing if you're a creator that's trying to create pitch decks, right? Or trying to communicate an idea, right? I mean, look, I have a Pinterest account for one reason only, to find references to, in order to create pitches. And I go to a meet and say, hey, it's like this meets this meets that. Look at this environment yeah. there. It's going to look like this, right? That's what it's for. And I think my journey is phenomenal. You just type in these text prompts and you keep doing variations. It's And it's fun. It's very quick, very cost effective. And it uses the same technique as I would have done if I was just taking images from the web for yeah. my pitch deck, right? But the lines get muddy when um, you start to commercialize that piece of work. Like I would never sell. Yeah. Yeah. I would never put those pitch decks online. I'm like, oh my God, I'm violating yeah. everything. Even when I would cut like sizzle trailers, like you, you'll take other clips from film to create a fake trailer to kind of pitch it to the studio. Mm-hmm. Everyone does that, right? And I think some of the directors like in the past have put that out on the web to kind of show, hey, it's what we've done. Um, it's phenomenal. But it's different when you're commercializing this. And when you commercialize mid-journey work or any kind of um AI gen uh, generative artwork, mm-hmm. you're selling other people's in bits of work in your work and it becomes yeah. very muddy because the part of it is that wow well, like you know it's its own it's a remix everything's a remix right we've all heard that term but at the same time a lot of the work are digital artists work that are on art stations and so on that they've spent so long trying to like the people that probably created arcane right if you type in like you know text prompt arcane 
characters mm-hmm. characters and you get this arcane looking thing and i was like, oh my god it's such a unique style and you don't realize well the guys that did the arcane show spent a decade creating they worked that look, yeah hundreds of hours right? trying to get that done yeah exactly yeah. so that's that's so that's a problem yeah yeah and I, I know we we had a previous conversation about it where it's also not quite there yet like it's it's you know we we mentioned the Secret Invasion, Marvels, the the yeah. opening credits is done yeah. with AI, and you can tell it's just it has that weird warped kind of effect, and it's it's, that, it's the it's, color, it's, it's like this yeah, pinkish haze to it. Yeah, it, it's just <laughs> not right. Like you just look at it and say, "Yep, that's Mid Journey," and so yeah, but I can understand people getting upset thinking that jobs are being stolen and work has been stolen and but look you know. man it's it's the thing is that as much as we we fear it as much as we can see the problems and which is rightly so why there's strikes in hollywood at the moment for this stuff it's not gonna go away yeah you know it's not gonna disappear right so we can it has so like, many uses it has so has many benefits it does of course it does absolutely like you know i read somewhere about ai being used in hospitals to help um read x-rays because at yeah. the moment like doctors look at x-rays based on their on their experience but if you have an ai assistant an ai and an experienced doctor you're most likely going to get because most x-rays are usually like 92 to 95 percent accurate in terms of like what it's diagnosing but if yeah. you can get to like 98 percent because of ai holy shit yeah, of course yeah. amazing yeah absolutely and it's never going to be tired. It's never going to have a bad day. It's, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't need it doesn't a cup of coffee. Strike. <laughs> it doesn't go on strike. Well, no, you'll get, you'll get people upset saying that. <laughs> but, but that, but that's the thing, right? You know, it, it's designed to help us make our lives easier. If, and it's, if it makes a person's job easier, it, yeah, it's a good thing. It's yeah. a good, but, but it's human nature. The reason why we have cars and fast cars and technology and everything it's because we want to make our lives easier right and that's human nature but i think the big thing is like you know for us for example at hazemation we're very interested in ai because we want to create our own data set we want to create our own data set which is using all of the work we have been created over the years and feed that into a data set and then i'm like okay i want to do i want to take the spaceship from the beyond i want to take Mm. the character from rift put that together and give me something that feels sci-fi anime. And all of a sudden I'm getting this really cool imagery, just like mid journey. The only difference is I'm not pulling from the web. I'm pulling from my data you, set. It's all stuff you own and made. It's, yeah. It's yeah. on an Amazon S- server. Speaking of, uh, because we're meant to be talking about a game, uh, Moontopia, <laughs> which is, is out now. You were able to take one idea and turn it into a game, which then became what we can see now through Fortnite. Um, so do you want to tell us a bit about yeah. the origins of Moontopia and how it kind of evolved into a game? Sure. I mean, as with like most production companies, we have a treasure trove of IP, right? And yeah. sometimes they're scripts, sometimes they're outline one page, sometimes they're full pitch deck. Or in the case of Moontopia, we went as far as creating a big animated trailer because it was basically going to be an animated series about a bunch of astronauts that um in the future you can travel around the moon as space tourism Mm -hmm. um it gets hit by a meteorite crash lands on the moon and you find out that there's monsters on the moon and they have to make their way back home the only way to make their way back home is to find the moontopia base get the only spaceship that's available and head back home but that journey there's a shit ton of monsters so we pictures gravity meets a quiet place set on the moon and we're like cool let's do a sizzle trailer we showed our annecy but then we got really busy with Rift. We got really busy with our other games and other projects. And I'm currently directing the cinematics for Dune, the video game for Funcom. Um, that's all I can say about it, by the way. I can't say I was anything going, I, Yeah, I was like, I can't <laughs> ask about Dune. No, you can't. But you can, I mean, they, they released an early trailer um, January at the Games Award. It's called Dune yeah. Awakening. So you can see that. And there's like there's a sequence of this guy with the hood walking through. This. That's my sequence. So I can talk well, about I'm. That. I'm old and I played like Dune One, which was kind oh. of like a, was an adventure Amiga? game. Was that on the Amiga? Uh, it was on the Amiga. Yeah, it was on yeah, the Atari ST as well. I think yeah, where I had it. I um, so I had Dune One. That was again like just a kind of story adventure game, clicking text, going to different places. Then Dune Two was like a real time strategy game. Right. I, I, I'd love to know what the new Dune, what type of game it's going to be. Can you even tell us that? I can only tell you that it's it's um. <laughs> Call to you. <laughs> I tell you. Like, I've just realized I, I could void every NDA that I'll sign. But all I can no, say is there, there, there is a, tra- there's a trailer on YouTube called um, Dune Awakening that came out in January yes. for the Games Awards. 
check that out. That'll give you an idea what the game is. Um, okay. And that's all okay. I can say. And, I, and I'm responsible for <laughs> okay. the cinematic. I'm just responsible for the cinematic. So my 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 team at Hazimation plug into Funcom and we do, we handle all the cinematic side. And then there's a the wonderful team at Funcom that are doing the amazing work on the game, which is like phenomenal. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, so, but no, so we, nowhere near as good as me and Tokyo, though, obviously. Oh, nowhere near. <laughs> Absolutely. Amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've only got like a couple of more zeros on, on their budget. <laughs> but that's okay. 